All right, good afternoon. My name is Araya Harley and I am the communications and the events manager for the Camp Chamber of Commerce. And today we are working on a um, part two series of a um, series three workshops. Um, so today we're focusing on employment and engagement. And as I mentioned, it's our HR business series, two of three. So there will be another one next month. Go ahead and check out our uh, calendar on our website to take a look at those dates and register for that. This meeting will be recorded and available for your uh, viewing on our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions or concerns for the presenters, there will be slides emailed to you later as well um, for the, their contact information. So again, today we will be um, hearing from BBSI. Frank and Jason will be presenting for us today, and I will go ahead and give them the floor. Go ahead, Frank. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome to, to our session today. Um, today is uh, Leadership Fundamentals and uh, as Aria mentioned, this is part two in a part three series. Uh, we're gonna focus on employee engagement. All right, so before we get started, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about BBSI uh, to give you a little bit of background of who we are and, and how we fit into this. But um, we help uh, small business owners with all things um, HR, payroll, risk uh, administration, and, uh, and kind of strategic management. So. Our, as a PEO, we, uh, we help organizations um, navigate those things um, by, by bringing that all um, to us and us managing the employees and HR and payroll initiatives. So that's a little bit about BBSI. We're located in Kent, uh, really happy to be there. Um, I'm the area manager for the Puget Sound area here. We are a global or a national organization. And um, there's my contact information. You'll have that if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. And our presenter today is uh, Jason. Uh, Jason is our HR um, consultant um, on our staff. So he's got a, a deep background in HR, 11 years uh, HR experience. Uh, Jason, I'll lead it to you and uh, have us tell you a little bit more about yourself and we'll get started. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. Good morning, everyone. So as Frank had mentioned, basically, I'm the HR consultant for BBSI here in the Kent, Washington branch. Um, I've been in HR for over 11 years now. Um, I grew my career in Silicon Valley with a startup organization. So I worked with a lot of small, medium-sized business. Um, and I've also worked for large organizations as well. So pretty much run the gamut of the journey of an organization. So I moved to Kent, Washington about five years ago. Uh, funny thing is I moved into the uh, the Kent Station apartment sight and seen. So I rented an apartment from California without ever seeing the place. So kind of interesting way to move from one state to another. So, but I love it here. I love, I consider uh, this area to be the nicer, cleaner version of the San Francisco Bay Area because people here are nicer and the place is cleaner. <laughs> so, which is good. So, so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, employee engagement. So if uh, as Araya had mentioned, this is part two of a three-part series. The first part was talking about talent acquisition. We talked about how to build a talent pipeline, how to do a compliant interview and things of the nature. This section is now about, they've accepted the job, now what? Now, as employers or people managers, you need to basically retain, engage, engage and retain your employees. The reason why we frame it this way is if you focus on engagement, the, 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 the turnout of that or the output of that is retention. And typically this is discussed with larger organizations, but I disagree. Any employer, small or large, should be looking at employee engagement. And I'll talk to you about the business case around that. So our objective today is really discuss the business case for employee engagement. What is the monetary implication for any business uh, on why they should focus on employee engagement and what it costs you if you don't? review some of the best practices surrounding employee engagement. And we're gonna focus on three methodologies right now that I've used in my, um, in, in, in my experience, but there is definitely a lot. Uh, staying interviews, I'll talk a little bit more about that, which I think is the most powerful tool uh, a, 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 a business owner or, or, or a people manager can apply. Performance management, meaning we'll talk about the uh, 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 the uh, the talent profile aspect and the talent mapping. And I'll talk in more detail about that. The one thing about uh, employee engagement and the, the, the 
the growing liter uh, academic research that's going happening with employee engagement is the concept of diversity and equity inclusion and how it relates to um, employee engagement and retention. That is a burgeoning topic that I don't have data on yet, but it is something that I'm keeping my eye on because um, as diversity, equity, inclusion is growing in, in, in topic and, and, and more experience about that, uh, a lot of researchers are, are measuring how that equates to, to um, employee engagement and retention and productivity. So more to come on that one. So let's set the face. Let's set the stage. Let's define what, um, what employee engagement is and the framework, framework around it. So according to Sherm, employee engagement is really about the life cycle of employee experience physically and emotionally, psychologically and behaviorally with their organization or their employer. Highly engaged employees feel safe, again, the psychological safety, and supported in these different states as, as a result, behave in ways that are more productive for the organization. So in layman's terms, but what that means really translate is, if someone feels safe in taking a risk in an organization, trying something new in, in performing a service or pr providing a new product, your employees are likely more to, to exhibit that type of behavior if the employee feels engaged in the workplace. So that's the, uh, a baseline. There's definitely a, a multitude of definitions from an academic perspective on what it means for employee engagement, but this is probably the most comprehensive that I've seen. And from a framework perspective, as I mentioned already, employee engagement is, think about it as an equation. Engaged employee, employees equates to productive employees, which equates to higher levels of revenue. Most of us are in a business to either provide a service, but also in the end run to make, to make a profit. That is really the number one, one of the fundamental reasons why businesses are in, in place. Now, if you are a community or a service organization, it's pretty much the same thing. Instead of the, uh, um, the productive employees, it doesn't generate revenues, but it, reven it generates basically uh, uh, satisfied clients, satisfied, satisfied customers and things of that nature. So let's talk about the business case. What's the impact? So disengaged employees basically cost a U.S. employers anywhere from $450 billion all the way up to $550 billion in productivity. That's according to Gallup in 2017. And every time you hear productivity engagement typically said in the same topic, think of it basically productivity equates to, again, revenue or productivity as far as whatever measurement that you are looking to measure in your organization. The second bullet is an interesting one, which is a study by a company called Siemens. It's a, multi, it's a global company in 2015. Basically the company with uh, a research as a company of hundred employees spent an average of 17 hours a week cl clarifying communication. So again, what the, the, what the study does in that situation is when communication goes out from like people managers or, or the C-suite or whatever it may be, there's definitely clarifying information that needs to be clarified based on that communication. And when they monetize the amount of effort that it took them to clarify those information, it equated to about $528,000 in, in, uh, in cost. And then in the five year span from 2011 to 2016, we also noticed that in, in, because of lack of engagement, the Bureau of Labor Statistics basically measured that um, that productivity only increased by 0.3% year over year. So from that time span, because of the lack of, of employee engagement, that was the impact on, on the productivity of, of companies. Companies who have low engaged employees, low engaged employee experience 18% lower productivity compared to their competitors who have engaged employees, 16% lower profitability, and 30%, 37% lower growth and if you are a company that works, if you work for a company that has stocks, basically lower engaged employees typically generate 65% lower stock valuation. The question I posit to you is how much is lost productivity worth in your company? So if you haven't measured what the, the productivity and the revenue generation for each employee is, definitely something to look at from a ratio perspective. And the easiest way to look at that is look at your net income divided by the number of your employees and that would be the, the revenue per employee that you would have. And that would be a simple way to calculate that. But there are definitely numerous ways to, to come up with that ratio. So again, we talked a little bit about what it costs the company, what it costs the potential company to have low engaged employee. Now we're gonna flip it. What is the impact or the, the positive impact or the return on investment 
if you increase productivity or increase employee engagement, and what does it impact to you? So if you can increase an employee's productivity by 25%, um, if, I'm sorry, engaged employees can increase your productivity by 25%. So as far as that's concerned, according to the McKinsey Global Institute. Now, if your employees are in the position where he or she can exercise their strength, meaning make autonomous decisions, creative decisions, things of that nature, basically there's a likelihood of sixfold in productivity wise in that regard. And increasing, again, one increasing uh, impact of engaged employees increases profits by $2,400 per employee. And then lastly, if people managers and business owners know how to basically leverage their own knowledge, skills and, and knowledge, skills and abilities to increase employee engagement, can actually enhance the earning potential of the company. So again, this is why we have these conversations, why we reach out to people managers and business owners to basically help them nurture their skill set and, and, and educate them on what it looks like to engage an empo uh, uh, their employee population. So let's break it down. As I mentioned, we're gonna talk a little bit about the employment engagement strategies and what that looks like. Here's just an overview of the three ones that I like to use and have used in my, in, in my experience. And as I mentioned already, there are a lot. Um, I use these ones because, I've, uh, again, they're very common, but it also is very scalable. So we're gonna talk a little bit about talent mapping, talent profile, and stay interviews. Now, the reason why I, I listed them this way is talent mapping is typically applied for larger organizations, um, probably about 20 or more. Talent profile uh, for smaller organizations, anywhere from five to 10. And stay interviews are typically applied for any size organization. I think that's the most powerful one. Um, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. So overview, talent mapping, basically it's a process in which a company assesses uh, current performance of its employees in a stratified manner. And I'll show you a grid in a little bit. And one of the ways that, uh, that HR typically does talent mapping is through a nine box. And I'll show you what that looks like. The objective is really to create a baseline of current performance of an employee. So if you think of a nine box grid, when I show it to you, you'll basically see uh, if you have a, a population of say 10 people, we can map each and every one of them into a particular box, depending on where they're at in their performance. The expected outcome is literally, again, it's a map of employee population to create a baseline and, it, and gives you an op opportunity to really make decisions. Do you manage up or do you manage out for low performing employees? And then for high performing employees, what do you do? All those things. The next one in the middle is talent profile. The talent profile is literally about a library of employee profiles. So for example, um, you have five individual employees. You wanna basically do an inventory of their, of their past accomplishments and what they're capable of and whatnot. And the expected outcome is really a profile library to understand current capabilities and readiness for new projects and organizational mobility. And when I say organizational mobility, what I mean by that is succession planning. So if you lose a manager, gosh, do you hire from the outside or do you hire from within? Do you have people ready to become that, to take on that role and responsibility? The last one is stay interviews. Stay interviews is literally a strategic conversation between a manager and employee to, a space, to attain a specific understanding for the manager on what keeps the employee to stay in his or her job. This is the ongoing conversation because in the first section we had interviews, job interviews, basically. Why would you like to come in to the organization? Why would you like to be part of our company? Stay interviews is basically a continuation of that and really ask the question, why do you, wh what makes you happy? What makes you wanna stay uh, employed with a company? And I'll give you some questions on how, to, how a framework on how to have that conversation, how to start it, how to conduct it, basically with a list of questions and also how to end it. Because you have to be very careful in how you end this because there is a bit of a trap with state interviews because typically when employees talk to their managers and the managers engage them with a real dialogue, there is that notion, oh, whatever I tell my manager is gonna happen. That's not always the case, right? Because you don't wanna make the conversation as pro uh, a promissory one. You wanna make the conversation as a fact finding and I'll, sh and I'll share some, tip, uh, uh, some talk track on how to, to manage that. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask any questions that you may have as well for, for me to clarify. So let's, let's go into detail on each individual strategy. First is employee engagement strategy, talent map, talent map or the nine box we like to use. The nine box basically is an axis, really. It maps employees on two, 
two particular axes, which is performance and potential. Performance is really what what's the quality of their work. You know, are they doing good? Are they doing bad? Are they going? Are are they steady? Especially for those long tenured folks. And then potential. Potential is all about what can they do more. Do they have that capacity to be to do more? Some you may be able to answer yes. Some you have to be realistic that they can't do more, and we will definitely identify those. Now, what the nine box does, or the talent map, is really help managers meet employees where they're at. Because when you talk about talent mapping, do you apply the same strategy for each employee? So if you think about your highest performer and then compare him or her to your not so highest performer, basically your low performer, do you apply A, the same level of energy in managing him or her? And, do you, and also do you apply the same strategy in the discussion with him or her? Of course you don't. You would definitely have different tactics on how you would apply that. And unfortunately, you would have to basically exert your effort appropriately based on what your business needs are. Next is also, do you, uh, is, uh, do managers exert the same level of effort of energy with all your employees, as I mentioned already? And then lastly, it, it really helps managers align efforts, basically their, their energy, with the business goals, right? If your goal is to grow, 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 which I, I believe most of you are looking to do that, uh, basically ranking and managing your employees in where they're at today will help you manage that and see where they're at. So for those, for those of you who have seen the, the nine box, this is what it looks like. So the two axes that I mentioned is potential and performance. And for each axis, there is a low, medium, high, or high, medium, low, depending on how you look at it. But if you notice, here, the low is kind of in the reverse, the low, medium, high ranking is in the reverse order, and you'll see why in a moment. The first part of a nine box is really what we call, if you've probably ever heard of the terminology ben bench strength, this is the readiness of individuals who are high performers or good performers or strong performers. Um, these are ones that are ready, so are they're almost ready and can be coached. At the very corner of one is the future leader. This is your high potential or as you probably may hear and from time to time, called HIPO, um, the top talent reward, recognize and promote and develop. And then you also have your growth employee, the demonstrate the high potential to advance. So basically these are the ones that are eager, uh, that are uh, wanting to learn more, have the capacity to learn more and so forth. And you have the high performer, which is a strong contributor um, uh, as far as that's concerned. So, what do you do with each one? Each one, you definitely apply different methodologies. For your future leader, the high potential, these are your top talents. You basically want to reward and recognize and promote and develop. The last thing you want is you identify the future leader and not have a conversation and tell him or her that you are my top employee. Because guess what? One of the things that if you don't have that conversation, they don't know. They don't, have the, they don't have the opportunity to, to be motivated or recognized for their efforts. Because if they don't know what you're thinking about their work output, guess what? Somebody else might and probably will do that for them, right? Because what I'm talking about is your competitors. The recruiters from other companies will reach out to them and basically compete for that talent. So again, engaging employees and having conversations with your growth employee who demonstrates high potential to advance have a conversation really to have really a discussion on what their potential is and what you see their potential is and what that could look like. It would be more about a coaching and more mentoring. And then for your high performers, your strong contributors, these are the ones you wanna challenge and reward and grow. When we talk about challenge, there is a concept called stretch projects. These are projects that probably that person hasn't been, exper hasn't been exposed to. If for example, if they are a sales individual, right? if they're strong in selling, um, maybe have them mentor someone else or be in charge of some sort of uh, oversight on P&L, profit and loss uh, discussions, things of that nature. Because it's a natural evolution for sales individuals for, for, ha to, for having that conversation. The next group of people basically is the core side, right? There is the enigma who are unrealized potential. There's, oh, there's you don't know where they're gonna fit in in the organization yet because of a couple of things. 
Um, the, it could be a, an issue with a job that the person skill set is not aligned with a job for one reason or another, or also the manager and the employee um, is not aligned because there are always going to be a situation where the employee and the manager do not get along for one reason or another. This one, if you identified someone who is a bit of an enigma, but has a potential to do something bigger and better, but you want, you want to take action immediately and indefinitely go in there and intervene and really understand from the employee's perspective what's going on. Because if you see potential in him or her, you definitely want to engage that person and have that conversation. The core employee is also an established individual. This is someone that's basically stable, that's probably doing well um, and that you can rely upon. So this is someone that you might want to motivate, engage, and reward. And when I say reward, it could be monetary, it could be a bonus, it could be extrinsic, it could be intrinsic, it de depends on what, what, your, what, what your capabilities are. And then there's the professional. This is the one that specializes or expert talent. Uh, this is the one that has been in the position of the role for quite a while, that knows what they're doing, that you can basically leave alone, right? Um, and most likely that this person has reached their career potential, so they're at the top of their game, uh, but they have no motivation to, to move up as a people manager, so they want to be either uh, an individual contributor, but they don't want to lead a team. Um, so this one, you would, for this individual, you want to reward and also probably put as a possible mentor or coach. These individuals, you definitely want to identify and leverage in a sense like if you wanted to replicate, new, if you wanted to have a new person come in and, and mimic to someone, this would be the person to pair them up with. This would be the, 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 the individual coach, the Sherpa, whatever you want to call it for your new hires, right? But you also want to train them on what that means for that. But this is the one that you want to challenge because these are the professionals that have been specialized in their career and they're expert talent. So as far as that's concerned. And then let's talk about the other half, the, the lower half, which is the dilemma, the underperformer and the effective. The effective one, again, similar to specialized talent uh, to the professional. Uh, these are specialized or expert talent, reach their career potential that knows what they're doing. Um, you want to engage and focus and motivate. However, they may have some issues. The difference between the effective and the professional is the effective is the one that you probably may not want to become the coach or mentor because they have some rough edges here and there. They know what they're doing, but they may have some rough edges that you don't want uh, new talent to, to mimic. So as far as that's concerned. Then the dilemma is likely to have scope to move one level up. So have potential to be, I don't know, a, a talent lead, uh, a group lead or whatever it may be, but we'll need a little bit of coaching as needed uh, as, they, as they refine their, their, their career. Because you don't see, they, you see them, they're not at their plateau yet, but they can plateau e very easily on their next uh, move upwards if need be or their next challenge. But one thing with dilemmas though, if you move them and give them a promotion, you can either see them plateau in that particular role or they can very well be challenged to potentially become a future leader or high performer or whatever it may be. So again, you gotta be careful with dilemmas because again, if you give them the opportunity to, to, to step up, there is definitely coaching needed to help them grow even further. Or if you don't, you'll probably see them as basically plateauing in that particular, particular role and that will be basically their core, uh, either the core employee or a high performer. And then the last one is the bottom corner, which is the underperformer. This is someone that's basically reached their limit of job potential and performance. This is where the question lies, do you manage up or manage out? That's a very difficult question to answer sometimes, but it is a necessary question to be asked for those individuals in this particular bucket. Because as people managers, you only have a finite time to exert in managing your employees. So unfortunately, this is, a, this is definitely a discussion uh, one, as a people manager or a business owner, you definitely have to engage your employees and really have those discussions and set the right expectation. You should have had conversations already that this person is not meeting expectations for what reason or for one reason or another, and really engage him or her and then determine and answer the question, is this person, can, can this person be managed up or be managed or needs to be managed out? Okay. 
any questions so far at this point? Jason, it's Frank. Can you talk a little about how practically to use this? I don't know if you're going to next, but how public is this information and, um, and those kinds of things? Very good question. So um, first, it depends on the person, right, on where they're at. Um, initially, this is typically management only, right? If you have a group of managers, this is something that you want to level set with other managers first, because there is the, a potential of a tunnel vision here. So you definitely want to level set with other managers if you can. Um, as far as visibility of where you map certain people, uh, I would definitely keep this with management level, management eyes only. However, the one area that I do wanna say that you should have conversations with is really about with the future leader, right? And, and, and the high potentials. Having that conversation is key because these are individuals that you would potentially be succession planning uh, for, right? Or with. These are the individuals you wanna move if there is a, a new role that comes up. Those are the ones that you want to have be ready for that conversation and 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 have that conversation. And that, uh, uh, you don't necessarily want to divulge where everyone el else is, like their peers, but you want to tell them that they are in the future leader or high potential bucket. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And also, good. Uh, one of the questions here is how often do you do it? Right. Um, I typically do recommend doing it on an annual or semi-annual basis, depending on the bandwidth of the organization. Because here's the thing, your business strategy or your business needs change. As we saw last year, we all had to pivot, right? For one reason or another. Um, so different landscapes of the business, if we're uh, depending on where you're at, if you're growing, you need people that are, can help you grow. If you're trying to be stable, you need people that will help you to be stable. So all those things come into play. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? Okay. I'm gonna move on to the next strategy. Let's talk a little bit about talent profile. Talent profile, again, uh, it's, it's typically applied to a certain level of population. Um, and what I've done is to senior level or talent or higher. And the term senior level is very uh, subjective because depending on what your organization defines a senior level, um, and you don't necessarily have to go by that particular definition as far as that. You can do it, depending on how large your organization is, you can definitely do this as well. But for large organizations, I would definitely recommend uh, focusing on a, pop, a particular population or particular hierarchy within your organization on up. And what does the talent profile do? The talent profile creates a collection of your talent of, uh, based on your current and potential leadership bench to identify strengths to leverage for projects. If you have some projects coming in on the pipeline or something that you want to investigate, these are the things that you want, you, you want to identify who has the knowledge, skills, and abilities to accomplish what the projects are. Also, really identify who needs challenge opportunities. Say, for example, for me, I'm an HR practitioner. I typically don't dabble in, you know, uh, accounting or finance, things of that nature. If there is an opportunity uh, for me to be introduced to that area, and if I have the, 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 the willingness to learn more about, you know, uh, uh, accounting and finance, great, offer me that opportunity. And the next, potential succession positions, right? So if I am a, uh, an HR practitioner and I'm an individual contributor today, and there happens to be a, a position open from an HR director perspective to lead a team, you need to know internally who are your people that is ready to assume that position. And conversely, based on the talent profile, that I may not have that knowledge, skills, and abilities to, re to assume that, uh, that, that role, you now, now have your answer. Basically, do you look inwards or do you look outwards? So you would probably hire from the outside. And then this talent profile can be customizable to track other skill sets, depending on what your organization is looking to do. So this is what a talent profile looks like. So we have an employee, his name is Luke Skywalker. And you can definitely, one of the things I've done is I work, I use the talent profile in tandem with the nine box. And basically the data comes on there, it gets put into this. So Luke basically is a, is, is a, is a I believe is a core employee. 
has a good potential and performance on the me medium side. And from a profile perspective, this is what it starts looking like. So from experience, basically he has experience as a Padawan trainer, his education, his current manager, and his location. So all those things come into play. And then company aspirations, right? This is a co definitely a conversation that's been had uh, between the manager and the employee. What are the goals that this person's like, like, looking to do from a career perspective? Luke definitely wants to become uh, a senior director or some sort of a VP role, whatever it may be in your organization. And then readiness for advancement. That's a very pertinent question because even though Luke wants to has aspirations to become these role, these particular roles, is he ready for these roles? So you have to be really honest on this particular situation and this particular boss right here, which is Luke is ready for a senior director promotion within six months, but would need more of a VP level eventually going forward. The next question is the flight risk component and really ranking it in high, medium, low. And I just wanna make sure what everybody knows about what flight risk is. Flight risk is basically the propensity of the individual to leave your company today, right? And it literally is red light, green light, yellow light. So you would have to rank that. And unfortunately, this is more of a gut instinct than anything else. Um, the, ma the manager should know or should have an idea of basically what that looks like. We, uh, us here in Kent Valley, we are in an interesting position because we are um, not only are, is Kent itself growing with a lot more business businesses coming into Kent, but we also have competition from the north side, from Seattle, and then Tacoma on the south side as well, right? So there's a lot of companies, uh, uh, businesses competing for talent here. So you already have a pre-existing condition of what the flight list looks like, and then also basically what the engagement looks like for this particular employee as well. So for Luke, we ranked him as a medium to high. So the next is what would be the action plan? To, look, to involve Luke in more cross-functional and high-profile projects. And then that is a very broad statement. Uh, as much as possible, you definitely want to be specific on what your action plan is, uh, whether it be giving Luke some more roles and responsibilities that's aligned with his skill set or areas that he wants to grow into. And then furthermore, there's other key areas that you want to, that you could definitely measure and track. Key attributes, basically control of the force is strong, Mechanical, mechanical hand, TIE fighter, pilot, three key areas of improvement, and that's something to look into. As for as we all know, I think Luke Skywalker is very pop, is very famous for not completing his training because he leaves his training quite often. Decision making, career planning, all those things you have to be ready for addressing uh, key areas of improvement. And then to balance that is we measure three most significant accomplishments and three other potential. And then lastly. Uh, identify potential positions that Luke may want, may be good at in, in growing into as far as that concerned. So this is what a talent profile looks like. So again, this is just a library and it helps you <clears throat> understand how to manage and engage an employee by, by really managing it and, 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 and gathering data. Any questions about the, the talent profile? Next, I wanna talk about uh, uh, stay interviews. Stay interviews, as I mentioned, um, as I said, regardless of what size of the business that you have or that you work with, stay interviews are probably the most powerful strategy that a, a people manager or a business owner can apply to any of his or her employees. The reason for that is this is just a, a dialogue between the employee and the manager. And it's a very powerful one because it really does uh, invite the, the, the the, the practicality and the honesty between uh, the relationship of the manager and the employee. So job interviews, as we all know, it, is basically why applicants want to join the company. So we have that conversation already. And the stay interviews is all about why, what, and how they want to stay in the company and really asking those questions. And stay interviews can really be applied to all levels of the organization. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the purpose is really for the manager to gain a better understanding of why employees stay and really hence the name staying interviews, right? Um, you can ask that question in so many different ways and you can definitely investigate and gather facts based on several uh, different types of, of topics. 
Typically, I like to apply this and teach managers on how to conduct this. So the direct manager should be doing this first, but I've also seen HR do this. If you have an HR team, you can definitely leverage him or her to conduct this for you. But again, you kind of take away the power of the outcome of this because it is a bit of a cathartic conversation between the manager and the employee. And it really has a targeted set of questions directed at the employee for, for him or her to respond to. There is an important thing to know about state interviews. The state interviews basically is a strong foundation of trust is needed. You, you may not want to do this with someone that there is a lack of trust or a low level of trust because if you already know that going into it, you may not get the response that you need, right? And then also, managers should be prepared for, diff prepared for difficult to hear responses. When you engage in state interviews, the most difficult response that I got that a manager told me is, I don't like you as my manager. You don't manage well. You don't know how to manage. Be prepared for that comment. Be prepared for that feedback. And for those of you who may not have heard that in the past, it will hit you right at your core <laughs> from a psychological perspective. So, but I caution you though, again, be prepared, take it within stride. And that's an opportunity for you to really understand. Give me an example, tell me more. What is it that I need to improve upon that you feel I need to improve upon? Um, and the key word there is that you feel that you need to improve upon, right? Because they're, what they're really telling you is, don't manage me this way, right? And I'm telling you, and when you're giving them example, when they're giving you examples, uh, they're giving you real life examples of how not to manage them. And it gives you an opportunity to challenge them. It's like, how do you want me to manage you going forward? So, and then uh, as Frank had mentioned already with the, with the, asked with the, um, the, the nine box, the results of this, uh, state interviews typically should be kept on a need to know basis. What I mean by that, depending on who is conducting this, if it is the direct manager, definitely keep it with yourself for the time being. Depending on who needs to know, peers of this individual person should never, should never know this right information, but it should be kept with management level personnel only um, or people that are managing this person, right? Because depending on your hierarchy on who's really conducting it, those are, uh, again, use your best judgment on need to know, but should never be on a peer-to-peer -peer basis based on who you're interviewing. Make sense? Yeah. So what does it look like from a framework perspective on, on a stay interview? Oh, and then, I'm sorry, my slides are not advancing. Okay, here we go. So starting the conversation. So, Key word with a stay, key thing with a, with a stay interviews is the manager has to be straightforward. Um, if you're like me who have difficulty in framing uh, certain things and have to be, you know, say it the right way and the right, you know, all the time, kind of have a corporate speak, you have to practice this, right? You have to be straightforward. Uh, you have to be transparent as much as possible. Some chalk tracks could start something like this. I would like to talk about the reasons why you stay with the company. So I understand what be able, so I can understand what I might be able to do to make this a great place to work for you. I would like to have an informal talk with you, find out how the job is going, how so I can do my best to support you as your manager, particularly within issues within my control. So those two talk tracks can be definitely applied. And again, depending on your style, it doesn't have to be a formal meeting. It could be the two of you have um, unpacking boxes together and just having the conversation and saying, hey, how's it going? How is it, how's it, how, how are you liking the job? You know, what is it? You know, things of nature. Depending on, again, you're meeting the, the employee where he or she is at based on your, where your relationship is at as well, right? Put your style on how you want to, into how you want to conduct the stay interviews. It doesn't have to be formal. Like I said, I've always done it myself in, in a meeting and it's a conversational meeting and I can definitely have that conversation and set the, set the tone of, uh, of the conversation. But like I said, it could be done in the warehouse, unpacking boxes together. But of course, be careful of who's with an earshot of the response because you definitely, especially when you, when you ask the question, how am I as a manager and the person gives you not so great response, you don't def definitely wanna have other people hear that, right? So you wanna contain that, so. Um, again, as I mentioned, the statements does not have to be exact as the examples I provided. Apply your own communication style. 
be, com be comfortable as much as possible. For, in, for, for managers who haven't really done it or thought of it in this particular aspect, because I believe most of you have probably done some, done some form of staying interviews at one point or another. Because if you are nervous, be honest with the employee, right? I'm really nervous about this conversation, but I want to have it, right? Um, I want to try something new. I'm trying to learn. So all those things, because especially when it, it's the same, same strategy that we apply when we are doing public speaking, when we, get to, when we try to get our, our, our butterflies out, be, be honest with yourself, be honest with your audience and tell your audience, I'm a little bit nervous about this, but bear with me, right? Because it level sets that. And, and what it does from a psychological perspective really is it gives you freedom to make mistakes. And when mistakes happen, the audience gives you that latitude as well to make those mistakes and forgive you, right? So the one thing I do want to make sure that you understand in this conversation as well is do not create a conversation that promises anything, right? This is an interview. This is fact-finding discussion. Um, you can definitely incorporate that topic or that even that statement in the beginning if you're, if you're not comfortable about it. You can definitely say at the end, it's up to you. But that's typically how you would start this conversation, really, and have the mindset of not making promise story. Um, because again, when, when communication happens between the manager or in, in organizational communication, typically is when employees communicate upwards, there is definitely a propensity for employees to say, hey, I've spoken to my manager and my manager agrees with me and they will do something about it. Let's face it, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's beyond our control, hence one of the, comp the talk tracks is within my control, or sometimes they don't fully understand why certain things happen, right? So it gives you an opportunity to educate uh, this individual or the team as a whole. So as far as that's concerned. So let's talk a little bit about what questions to ask. So these are some questions. This is just not, uh, this is not the, um, the end all be all of a set of questions, but these are the ones that I typically talk about. <clears throat> these are, you don't, and again, you don't have to frame it verbatim, but these, these are the questions that really that, that you want to discuss during a stay interview, such as what do you look forward to when you come to work each day, right? What that really asking, what that is really asking is what makes you want to come back to work, right? Is it about the money, <laughs> depending on where they're at? If you pay well, great, not a problem. That's a motivator for that person, right? And this is where it comes into play, depending on that, if you get that response, I think I talked about it in our last session is Maslow's hierarchy, right? If you have someone that basically is in a supporting role, money is very important to him or her because they need to support themselves and their family and the people they care about. So that's very important. Um, what do you like most or least about working here, right? Again, this is that question, be prepared to get that, <laughs> that not so great answer that may actually be you at the center of that response. And the, the fourth one, I'm gonna skip to the fourth one, I actually like this question is, if you can change something about your job, what would that be, right? Sometimes this one takes a moment for employees to think about on what, how they wanna structure their job. Um, but it's a very powerful question and a very powerful response because depending on what the role is, right, there might be an opportunity for the person to provide, hey, I think when we process orders, it just takes too long from this point to this point. If we do it this way, it would be a lot faster and the customer will be happier because of X, Y, and Z. So it gives you an opportunity to understand from, look at this, their world from their perspective as well. But at the same time, again, there's always going to be a, fl a flip side to this. So that's why you got to be careful on the promissory uh, aspect, because if they provide you feedback on, a, on what the change would be, again, it may not be something feasible for whatever reason, because if the change that's, that they're proposing requires you to put in some capital expenses or whatnot, that's, you know, that's definitely a discussion from a management perspective. So again, all these questions are just some examples. Uh, you can pick and choose. You can definitely cater uh, questions that may that is specific that what you're looking for 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 that particular individual. Whether it's going to be performance, you know, hey, I noticed that you're uh, how, 
you know, how, how do you feel that your performance is going? Uh, would you rate it high, medium, low? Uh, and why would you rate it that way? And things of that nature. And what can you do to improve that? So all those questions come into play. Um, there's definitely a variety of questions that you can frame it depending on the theme that you're looking for. Um, again, questions do not, do not have to be exact. Adjust the question that match your own style, um, your own communication style and meet your goals um, as far as that's concerned. So any questions so far on the questions, on the type of questions? Okay. Now, once you've closed the the, the conversation, uh, I'm sorry, uh, said, said all the questions that you want to have. And typically this conversation can take anywhere from an hour to, I don't know, an hour and a half, um, depending on how many questions you want answered or whatnot. What you don't want is just really bombard the employee with so many questions that doesn't matter, right? Um, again, you know your employees well enough, hopefully, that you know how much attention span he or she may have because if the person has an attention span of you know a short-term attention span you definitely don't want to have a stay interview that's an hour long you probably want to break it into chunks probably 30 minutes here and there and things of that nature so um, now the next thing we're going to talk about is closing the uh, the stay interviews right during the stay interviews definitely hopefully you were taking some notes because in closing you know, you definitely want to state at some point, that's all my questions for right now, but I do want to summarize some of the key themes and the, of your responses. Uh, stay positive in the response. As I mentioned earlier, some of the responses that you may get is something that you may not like or want to hear, but you needed to hear. That would be a powerful opportunity to give that a positive spin, right? Basically, I wasn't aware that productivity or the process was, was, was hindering your, the workflow. This is something I would, would, would like to investigate and research. And then at the same time, let me some, uh, some talk tracks could be, let me summarize what I heard from you about the reasons why you stay, again, as well as the reasons you might leave. So all those things come into play. I appreciate you sharing your thoughts with me today. I am committed to doing what I can to make this a great place to work for you. Um, so again, that's something that's taking the, the employees into consideration, but not really making a promise that things will change, right? You will look into it as much as possible. Because again, any time a, a manager tries to gather data, you definitely want to be prepared to take some action and whatever that action is may result based on the conversation. And then lastly, take the employee for their candor and appreciate the value of the feedback. Um, this day interview, as I mentioned, again, is a very powerful dialogue if done well. The employee and the manager will 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 typically come out two ways from from what I've seen. It really enhances the relationship between the manager and the employee, because from the employee perspective, the employee feels heard, right? And then from the manager perspective, the employee has a better understanding on how to manage and motivate and engage that employee, and therefore again resulting to higher productivities. Okay. Any questions in the staying interview so far? So let's summarize what we just talked about, right? We started talking about engagement and the, the implications of disengaged employees. Disengaged employees are costly. It costs companies billions of dollars in lost productivity. And productivity equates to revenue or whatever measurements or key performance indicators you have within your organization. Now, conversely, if managers nurture their employees' engagement, can increase productivity by at least 25% which again results in stronger revenue or whatever, again, key performance indicators that you're measuring your company by. I presented to you three possible strategies to engage employees, the talent map, which enables managers to meet employees where they're at and lead them appropriately and manage them appropriately, I should say. The talent profile, an inventory of employee skill set, capabilities and potential successors. So you can definitely leverage employees going forward uh, based on their current uh, skill set that they have today. And then stay interviews managers helps managers to understand why their employees stay or the propensity to or the potentiality to leave your company when it comes to employee engagement i always say this to managers if you do not manage it if you do not manage your own employee engagement somebody else will and what that somebody 
is probably going to be a recruiter from another company. So, as I mentioned earlier, there is growing research on how DEI and employee engagement impact business productivity. And um, again, this topic is growing and constantly evolving. Um, hope to have a new a set of data for you uh, in the coming months or even probably next fiscal year. So that is all I have. I left some about 10 minutes for any questions or answers that you may have, if any. Any questions? Okay. Uh, can we, oh, this is Rosa. Uh, can I get a, a copy of the talent uh, profile? Uh, so kind of idea of how to sure. do one? Um, uh, I, I will be sending you the PowerPoint deck on this one. So you, what I've done in the past is literally just use this PowerPoint. Uh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it out of here. So. If you if you have PowerPoint, you can or Microsoft Word, you can copy and paste from here. So I'll send you the the not a PDF form, but the actual PowerPoint. So you can just basically put you know type on here what you're looking for. So you can use this as an actual template. So, and I've also heard in some cases some companies don't put a picture there um, for whatever for various reasons. So it's up to you if you want to use a picture or not. It's up to you uh, as far as that's concerned. So some people don't like it, but some people do. So. I'll definitely give this and as well as the talent, uh, the nine box, and as well as the, the, all of this will be readily available for you, by the way. And I think, Araya, you will, ha uh, I'll be sending this, this to you and you'll be distributing it to the attendees. Is that correct? That is correct. I'm actually going to uh, drop off or, or whatnot, then um, everyone will get it. I didn't see any, any other questions I can answer for. I was going to say, I didn't see any in the chat. So, um, you know, I will again, as I mentioned, I will not waste slides over questions that you'd like to ask Jason or Frank. Um, the information will be uh, in the email. All right, we just got some thank yous in the chat. Um, so yeah, if we don't have any other questions, we'll go ahead and give you guys back a couple more minutes. Yeah, uh, so next, month's I'm sorry. Discussion, uh, next month's discussion is going to be surrounding about compliance and managing your employees either, you know, uh, how to exit your employees in a, in a com very compliant way. Sounds good. Yep, so don't forget to register for the next month. We'll have um, event email sent out to remind you guys. Uh, once you register, we'll have a reminder for this event as well. Um, again, thank you for um, attending today. And thank you, Frank and just, uh, Jason. I don't know why I was going to call you Jessica. I was looking at the notes. <laughs> um, thanks. Have a great day. Bye-bye.